So I haven't seen the governor's video, so I have my prepared comments, but I was also going to uh, make sure <laughs> make sure I didn't repeat anything that anybody who's pre-recorded said, which is something I am able to do, but they will not be because they have already recorded their comments. So I guess some of this might be a little bit duplicative, but um, should I just get started? Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> okay. Great. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Max Nardo. I'm a policy analyst at the state legislature. Uh, I work with the uh, Senate Democrats, and I help coordinate the Senate's work on spending some of the federal money that we're talking about today. Um, specifically, uh, we received a big pool of money uh, from the American Rescue Plan Act, or ARPA, as we all refer to it. <clears throat> um, this was the one big COVID spending package approved by the Biden administration right after they got into office. Um, and because these can all kind of run together in my mind, this is the bill that sent out $1,400 stimulus checks and it increased the child tax credit. Um, it extended unemployment. And one of the things it did, which we're gonna talk about today, is it sent states and local governments pretty big chunks of money to spend on pandemic relief based on their own unique circumstances. So in our case, the state of Colorado received about $3.8 billion in fiscal recovery funds. And that's a lot of money for any state, um, but especially because Colorado has TABOR, as you might know if you're politically inclined enough to be attending something like this, Colorado is the one state in the country where the legislature cannot raise taxes. Uh, so it's really an even bigger deal for us. So there's a lot at stake with this one-time infusion of money, so it's important we get it right. So uh, it was last legislative session when this money came in, about a quarter of it was set aside for budget stabilization, about a quarter was approved last session for some emergency spending, transportation, housing, health. And the other half was um, not quite ready to be spent right away. If you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, the powers that be wanted some time to think about how to use this money strategically. Uh, so we created a couple of task forces. So legislators and experts could work all throughout the summer and fall to come up with the best ways possible to spend this money. There were a couple of important areas that were agreed upon. Um, so that's what's in these big boxes here. So the blue box is affordable housing. It was decided to spend another 400 million on that, and it was left to the task force to figure out exactly how to divide that up for the best results. 450 million for behavioral health, and that's the big orange box. And then the big yellow box is economic recovery. So those are the three pools I'm gonna be talking about in this presentation. And if you could go to the next slide, um, the economic recovery box is actually not quite as big as that because some of this money is quasi earmarked for ongoing discussions for homelessness initiatives, um, the Unemployment Trust Fund and kind of an unknown pool of ongoing COVID expenses. Um, okay, so I'm about to run through these three big pools and I, I'm, a, I'm a both about to share a lot of information, but also not that much information because um, a lot of this money is being allocated for grant programs and they will eventually fund individual projects, but those individual projects are not decided yet. Uh, so the, the, the place we are at is the task forces have produced final reports with legislative recommendations. Bills are being drawn up now, and it seems reasonably likely, you know, pending the decisions of our legislators, that the, the bills are going to look a lot like the recommendations. But again, the actual projects that are going to be funded aren't decided yet. So uh, I hope you can forgive the lack of specificity. Uh, if there was more to give, I would. But I'll tell you where we're at now, and then your legislators can continue keeping you updated as time goes on. So if you could go to the next slide. Uh, first, we're gonna talk about housing. The housing panel had these five recommendations with low and high-end funding. And I'm gonna briefly talk through these, but I do wanna start with a bit of a sober assessment of this. The housing problem in the state, I mean, the, the housing affordability crisis is vast and even $400 million is not really enough to transform the situation. You know, ask anybody you know, multiply that by the 5 million people that live in the state or 5.7 million people. And this money, it's just not really enough to really transform the problem. That being stated, it is a lot and it's the most we've had in an extremely long time. So I'm gonna talk through some of these funding priorities. 
Um, the thing, uh, the revolving loan fund, you know, this is so the state can have a big pool of money and for a variety of types of projects, whether that be a new development or the preservation or rehabilitation of an existing project, it can loan money to these projects at below market rates and then get that money back and loan repayments over time. So it can be a, an ongoing or perpetual fund and source of financing. A lot of affordable housing projects are cobbling together federal tax credits, loans, grants, and this will be a big source of money for that. Secondly, we have uh, actual grants. So like I said, collab uh, combination of fund sources for a lot of low income housing projects. The first one is loans, the second one is grants. Um, I am gonna highlight uh, one thing that is gonna come out of this grant program. Can you go back to the um, housing slide, please? I am gonna highlight one thing that I think is gonna come out of these grants that's pretty cool, um, is the Strong Communities Fund grant program. This grant program funds uh, studies or uh, kind of matching money for communities that are willing to make changes to allow more affordable housing to be built. So this could be something like if a city wants to upzone a neighborhood to allow more density or allow apartment buildings or transition like a plot of empty land into housing and, and rezone it for that. Uh, so far, this pool, of, this pool of money was actually created last year and this will be adding to it. And it funded a couple of things in the area, the Longmont housing assessment updates, $86,000 for that. Louisville housing plan, $60,000 for that. Superior Affordable Housing Strategic Plan, $120,000 to that. So those are the types of things that have come out of this right away. Um, thirdly, the third pool here is resident-owned communities. In the last few years, we've passed some cool laws saying that if the owner of a mobile home park puts it up for sale, there are some processes required that will give the residents a fair chance to buy it and own it themselves. And this has already worked in several instances. And one reason I think this is a cool policy is that um, these communities are some of the only naturally occurring affordable housing around that isn't subsidized by government funds. And it's a relatively affordable way to get people from you know, perpetual renting into ownership for wealth building that will be for the family for a generation. Um, modular housing, this is direct funding to, uh, it's kind of two parts to it. One of it is to like attract and encourage the industry of creating modular housing, which is like prefabricated. It's a, a, a group of housing types of prefabricated housing could be 3D printed or manufactured or shipping container, uh, but for new innovative ideas. And when labor costs for building new houses are really high, this holds promise to produce housing types that could be affordably purchased. So as a consumer of housing, you could save costs while it also supports a budding industry in the state. Last thing is this CHAFA, the Colorado Housing Finance Authority, if I have that acronym right, the Missing Middle Access Program. Most subsidized housing programs are for lower income people. This is a program that creates and subsidizes housing for people that are in the 80 to 120% of the median income. So this could be like a teacher in Boulder, not, not a high paying profession, um, but you know maybe around the area median and supports housing for these people. I don't have this on the slide, but there's also another $200 million earmark for some really important homelessness initiatives. And I think anybody who has, I don't know, been pretty much anywhere in Colorado realizes that homelessness is exploding. So there are three things coming out of this. The biggest chunk is a grant program for local communities to access state funding um, to build out a continuum of solutions across the spectrum. And really the emphasis is like quickly connecting people who are experiencing homelessness to services and treatment and temporary shelter or housing. I, again, this is one where I just can't tell you what the projects are going to be because uh, local communities are going to design these ideas based on their needs and their ideas and then get state matching funds for it. I think something we've seen in Denver that is, uh, you know, a likely candidate would be like the, um, I'm forgetting what they call them, uh, commu uh, the Community Village Collaborative has a couple of these. They're like outdoor safe camping sites, safe safe rest villages is what they call them in Portland. Um, 
it's like a lower cost way to get people like immediately off the streets and out of a camp and into something where there are some social services available. Okay, if you'll go to the next slide, I'm gonna breeze through these pretty quickly, but there are eight funding recommendations coming out of the Behavioral Health Task Force, uh, Community Behavioral Health Continuum of Care GAP grants. That was a bit of a mouthful. Um, they're gonna complete a regional assessment to identify, cap, uh, identify gaps in the service continuum and provide funding for local governments. Um, secondly, expand the behavioral health workforce. There's like a deficit of many, many types of uh, workers within the behavioral health continuum. So this is a, a very large chunk of money uh, for state agencies to you know, start with developing a plan to invest in workforce expansion. This is going to require recruitment, training, retention. Money can be used for a lot of different things, but just to make sure we have a staff capacity to deal with this. Adult inpatient and residential care. There just aren't that many places you can go to stay if you are having a severe behavioral or mental health issue. So this is a lot of funding to make sure we have enough facilities uh, within the range of needs. Uh, criminal justice grants, diversion, early intervention. This proposal is about 70 million to fund communities to develop or expand pre-arrest early intervention programs, but to make sure we have staff and programs to keep people out of the criminal justice system at an early age. Um, next up, this is about investing in youth and family residential and outpatient care across the state. A lot of what we do have is not suited for youth and families. So this will expand that. Um, care, navigation and coordination. This is about, uh, some of this is training existing navigators to help ensure that those who need behavioral health services can access them and ensure accountability serve those with the highest needs. This is also going to provide money for immediate life-saving interventions like purchasing naloxone. Um, Primary behavioral health care integration. This is about integrating behavioral health into more primary care. Um, so there'll be staffing and training associated with that. And then I'm looking at the clock here and knowing I need to speed up. So lastly, this tribal residential behavioral health facility, it's uh, providing one-time funding for the renovation of an existing Southern Ute um, facility for inpatient services and transitional housing. If you could go to the last um, slide here. The last big pool of money, if you remember the big yellow one was the economic recovery. <clears throat> the economic recovery task force didn't produce legislative recommendations like housing and behavioral health did. It essentially identified a group of problems and there's lots of ways that the legislature could address those. So this work is, is further behind the other two and that we did come out with legislative recommendations and we are working on these now. Uh, a couple of things are likely to come out of this, which is the homeless initiatives I already described, and then some money is kind of earmarked for COVID. And the other prioritization is just in progress. So that's a big, a big TBD to stay tuned on. That'll be a big focus of the rest of the session because that, you know, that remainder box there is going to be maybe three or four hundred million dollars. Um, I think some of the types of things that might come out of this fund, there, there's recognition that. There is a deficit of childcare workers and facilities in the state relative to needs right now. So um, things like teachers and the healthcare workforce, those are some ideas that, that keep coming up and I would not be surprised if they ended up receiving funding out of this. But I think your representatives are gonna have to keep you posted. So like I said, that was both a lot of information and also not that much specific information. I wish I could tell you more about what is going to be coming up in your district out of this money. This is where we're at now. A lot of these are going to be grant programs that organizations in your district can be applying for to build things out. And that's where we are now. Max, that was terrific. Can you, um, can you help us with where would folks go if they want to know specifically, you mentioned the housing program in Longmont and the, the housing program in Louisville. I know there's a, a big housing program in Lafayette. Where, where would folks go if they wanna learn more? Would they go to the task force website links or are there other places they can look? Yeah, 
Max, I think you're, new, you're, you're muted. Good. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Uh, it's a good habit to mute yourself when you're not talking, but then a bad habit to forget about it. Um, <laughs> if you go to the task force websites on the General Assembly website, yeah, you, you can you can browse the final report for any of these. They're all about 30 pages and, and quite digestible if you want to learn more about the work of the task forces. Um, did, did that answer the question or did you want to know more about specific projects? Yeah, that's great. That's where I've been going. But I know you also, since you had mentioned specific programs, I was curious if there was any other place that they could look. The task force is a, is a great place to start for sure. Um, I don't think I would have another resource generally, but I would say if you have a question, reach out to your representative. They can reach out to me and we'll get you the information. Thanks so much, Max. That was a great um, and a lot of great information. Appreciate it. Um, I see that um, Attorney General Phil Weiser, you're on. Would you like to go ahead? I am. It is great to be virtually with our Boulder friends and neighbors thinking long and hard about what is an extraordinary, really once in a generation opportunity. I wanna talk about a few issues that are really close to my work and my thinking. First about water, second about mental and behavioral health. Um, third, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, fraud because that's an issue that we need to be working on. Um, and finally, maybe just a few other, um, other sort of related points. Uh, first water, uh, in Colorado, we've got this great saying, which is, in Colorado is a land where life is inscribed in water. How we manage our water is a big deal. And you've been hearing a lot about it. This Nebraska issue, this plan to move water from the San Luis Valley to Douglas County, the Colorado River, the short version, we're in for some challenges. There is less natural snowpack today than ever before. What we all know is you cannot deficit finance water. You either have it or you don't have it. We've got a series of water infrastructure management projects around our state, some of which is quite antiquated, really. We have this uh, really important opportunity of how we better use water, building in more ways to conserve water, smart storage opportunities for water, reuse opportunities for water, the question is, are we gonna use this time to be maximally effective? In the best version of Colorado, we take some of this ARPA money and we build smart water infrastructure that supports better water quality, better management of our water, better resilience, better adaptability. I've called for $100 million to that end. And part of the reason why it's so important to use that ARPA money now is it turns out we need state money that we could free up to support matching grants for the water uh, funding from the Infrastructure Act. This is a very big opportunity, it affects all of us in Colorado. By the way, quick commercial note, we sued a bunch of companies today related to putting out PFAS into what is in effect our water, and it's a public health risk. We're gonna hold them accountable. That's just one more example of the water infrastructure concerns that we're looking at. Number two, behavioral health, and I wanna talk about opioids because it's really an area that I've been working long and hard on. We have to recognize that we don't have enough drug treatment in Colorado. We have about 16% of what we need. We don't have enough mental health support. And what this is doing is putting a load on our criminal justice system that it's not meant to bear. It's not right. It's not smart. The money that we're getting from suing these pharmaceutical companies, McKinsey, other wrongful actors is substantial. $400 million we're bringing back Colorado. We just secured that last week. However, it's not enough to meet the challenges, which means communities around the state can and should use ARPA funding to better address this once in a generation opportunity. And that's something that I'm committed to supporting, working with. I know the Boulder community is gonna be very scrappy and smart as to how it uses its funds. The other point I wanna mention is if we do this smartly and robustly, it's gonna pay huge dividends. I'll give you an example. When someone leaves prison, are we setting up re-entry programs supporting their behavioral health needs so they don't go back to an addiction that they had before they end up serving their sentence? We need to make sure that we do that. Um, this is an important opportunity. And finally, 
I want to talk about this False Claims Act and fraud because it is really important. And thank you, um, and Jennifer, I'm not using the slides. Um, we can probably remove that um, question slide if people want. Um, how do we make sure that if people do defraud the state of Colorado with these ARPA funds or other funds, we can hold them to account, get the money back. This False Claims Act we're pushing would give whistleblowers a chance to relate what they hear, actually called relators under the law, and make sure that these uh, stories of fraud get to our office so we can take action, hold people accountable, get money back. Uh, that's a critical step we need because when you make all these investments, there's room for error and people playing games. So I'm committed to taking advantage of this opportunity. I'm glad to have such fabulous representatives thinking hard about it. We need to do it smartly together. That's who we are in Colorado, collaborators and innovators. Um, I have time for a quick question or two, if uh, there are any, starting with our great representatives. And I think, um, thank you yeah. so much for that presentation. I think we'll do questions at the end if you're okay to stay on well, until the end. I've got to jump. I've got to jump. So I'm okay, happy to go ahead. If anyone to others to then. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank, thank you, you so all. much. Appreciate the time to be here with you all. Take care now. Thank you. Thanks a lot. All right. Um, well, I think we might, let's try the videos again. We'll see if that'll work. Um, let me get that on. And in the meantime, while you're doing that, I know some of us are answering some questions in the chat and we can try to take more after the videos. Sure, that works great. I know I saw a lot of great questions in the chat. All right, let's see if this one will work. Good evening, everyone. I wish I could join you live, but I don't wanna miss this opportunity to talk about the incredible opportunity we have to transform Colorado's future through historic federal funding. I wanna begin by thanking Senator Juarez Lewis, Representative McCormick, and Representative Burnett for hosting this important conversation tonight. I'm so proud that Colorado is recovering faster and stronger than many of our neighboring states. After seven consecutive months of decline, our unemployment rate has dropped significantly, well under 5%. And December marked the fourth straight month with Colorado adding at least 9,000 payroll jobs. But despite the momentum, we know there's still a lot more work to do to save Coloradans money to make our state more affordable for everyone. That's why this once in a generation American Rescue Plan Act funding is such an exciting opportunity. With these one-time funds, we have the chance to invest in real solutions that get to the root of some of our most pressing challenges as a state. Challenges like affordable housing, rising housing costs or pricing people out of neighborhoods they've lived in for decades and often make it difficult for businesses to recruit new talent near where the jobs are. Families struggle to find homes near where their kids attend school. It's not a new issue for our state, but it's one that's gotten worse over the last couple of years. And our priority in partnership with the legislators and local leaders is to encourage more supply of housing on the entire continuum of housing development while ensuring the investment of these resources is done in a way that supports our environmentally forward-looking solutions and well-planned growth to reduce traffic. We're also focused on strengthening our workforce. Our workforce needs to be agile, which means focusing on skills-based education where learners, both youth and adults, can upskill and reskill over their lifetime to maximize their earnings and potential. That's why we're looking forward to expanding work-based learning opportunities, including apprenticeships, investing in navigational services and support for job seekers, and giving people the digital skills to initiate their employment search and to obtain the best work possible. And finally, we want to invest to ensure that Coloradans can access mental and behavioral health resources that they need when they need them. This pandemic has been hard on Coloradans, which is why we want to cut through the red tape and create a streamlined system that puts people first. It's going to take all of us working together to turn this vision into reality, and I know that we can do it. And we wouldn't be able to do it without tonight's hosts, Senator Juarez Lewis, Representative McCormick, and Representative Burnett. And I want to thank all of you for your hard work on behalf of the state of Colorado. And to the attendees, thanks for joining us tonight. All right, and then we're also lucky enough to have a uh, video from Congressman Jonah Goose. Hopefully that will work. Hi, everybody. Jonah Goose here. I am proud to represent Colorado's second congressional district, the most beautiful congressional district in the United States in the U.S. House of Representatives. And I want to say thank you for everyone joining today to discuss your concerns, your ideas, and your perspectives. I am so sorry that I can't be with you in person today. 
but I am sure that my good friends, Senator Lewis and representatives uh, Tracy Burnett and McCormick will provide great insight with respect to their work at our state capitol uh, and everything that they are doing to serve our communities every day. But I also wanted to take this opportunity to share just a few brief words with all of you before this important discussion. It's no secret that the last two years have been difficult for everyone. Every day, teachers are accomplishing the impossible and our healthcare heroes are putting themselves on the front lines of the pandemic by taking care of Americans in need. When I voted to pass the historic American Rescue Plan one year ago, the health and safety of those leaders were at the top of mind. And as we continue to fight back against this pandemic, it's critical that we continue to provide needed resources to our community and provide access to high quality, affordable health care. Thanks to the American Rescue Plan, we're working to do just that. The plan is providing direct housing and nutrition assistance to the Americans hit hardest by the virus. The plan is supporting hard hit small businesses by providing the necessary infrastructure for them to get back on their feet. And the plan is providing the resources needed to allow schools to be open, ensuring the safety and success of students across our country. There is progress still to be made, a lot of it, and healing that we need to do. But together, we can continue to address both the public health and economic needs produced by this pandemic and deliver vital resources to our local communities. I'm so proud to represent a district, a state, a community with such dedication to crushing this virus through action. And I'm so grateful for the role that each of you played to move the needle forward one step at a time. Please know that my offices are always open to your calls, to hear your ideas, your suggestions, your concerns, you name it, and to work in partnership with you to solve this problem. I'm here to represent you and your values, and I wanna hear your solutions. So thank you again for hosting this town hall today and for sharing your thoughts and your concerns. Please stay safe and stay hopeful. All right. Great message, as always, from Congressman Naguz. Um, Hi, everybody. Oh, Joe Naguz. Don't want to watch it again, though. <laughs> um, all right. Let's start on our legislative update from our members. Um, let's start with Representative Tracy Burnett. Hi, everybody. I wish I could see all of you in person, but uh, thank you for uh, being here tonight. I'm Tracy Burnett, representing Eastern uh, Boulder County, uh, Longmont, Lafayette, and Louisville. And uh, I'm gonna just give a quick update. Um, House Bill 1249 microgrid roadmap. Oops, microgrid is spelled wrong, by the way. <laughs> this, is, this has just been read over. Uh, it is a bipartisan bill that is really looking at grid resiliency. That means like if you have a wildfire and a transmission line goes down, you know, how do you build in uh, resiliency of your electric grid, as well as um, just the regular occurrences that keep our that that sometimes disrupt our, our, our um, electricity, like I call it like squirrels and tree limbs. So what this is doing, this is a very strategic roadmap that looks at how can we improve the grid resiliency and reliability of our electric grid using microgrids. Microgrids, think of you know, solar panels and storage. So um, this is, I, I have to say, no one so far, knock on wood, is against this bill. It is a great bill because it hits so many uh, needs that we have here in Colorado. Um, my other bill uh, that just got read over is uh, House Bill 1252, public school contracts. And what this does in a nutshell, it saves schools time and money and it protects student data privacy. And by that, I mean, you know, there's a lot of school districts, they, they spend a lot of time, um, you know, uh, negotiating uh, contracts, vendor contracts for goods and services. But the problem is a lot of times, especially with large vendors, the, uh, they're headquartered in a different state and the law, if there is a violation in that contract, those, uh, the laws of that other state apply, not Colorado's laws. So think about things, our Colorado laws on student data privacy. And uh, just think about how much time 
um, is spent in renegotiating these contracts to make sure they fit and 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 work with Colorado laws. So this is uh, this is a bill that was brought to me by the St. Frank Valley School District, and um, and uh, you know it, it, again it's a bipartisan bill and uh, will save a lot of schools time, money, and uh, protect student data privacy. I'd like to get on to my big bill, uh, and that is air quality. And I know, I, you know, I've talked about this before. It is an ozone improve air, ozone air quality improvement bill. And as you know, we have some of the worst air quality in the world. Wildfires have make it worse. But what I'm doing is this is fundamental. This is fixing the process. For how, and, and bending the curve on getting back into attainment on ozone. You know, there's a lot of modeling. Uh, what the, uh, the health department does is that they model air quality. And if a new source comes on, you know, asks for an air quality permit, then they model it and they say, oh yeah, okay, well, you know, we'll write you a permit. What I discovered this last year is that many of our smaller sources of air pollution are not even modeled. And then think about, it, not only many of them are not modeled, but think about the cumulative effect, the cumulative impact of all these different minor sources that are not even modeled. This is the core of what I am trying to do, is model that so and make sure that when another when another source comes along if it is going to increase air emissions we do something about it we don't issue that permit or we do something else so that we don't keep making our ozone problem worse there's other parts of this bill too increased air monitoring monitoring this means aerial monitoring stationary monitoring all those things so we can find out where the problems are with our ozone problem. It includes enforcement, it includes reporting to the public, having the public have a bigger voice in how we bend the curve and get back into compliance on air quality. So I know a lot of people are excited about this bill. They're like, when are you gonna bring it over RepRNet? It is a big transformational bill. These kind of bills take time. It's coming along, it's coming along. So hang in there. Um, okay, another really big bill I have is uh, model uh, energy codes. And this is really gonna help transition Coloradans to a clean, sustainable future by weaning, by doing things like having elect, uh, new buildings, having being electric vehicle ready, electric heat pump ready so that we can wean ourselves the, off of gas if we want, for, but they're for those who want to still have gas into their building, they need to compensate for the carbon that is created when you're burning the, that gas. I think one of the things I've learned in putting together this energy code bill is, um, is indoor air quality. Uh, I found out recently that simply burning, uh, burning um, heating a cup of water on a gas stove, the air pollutants that are released in doing so would not be allowed by the EPA if it were outside. I think people are gonna learn more and more about how dangerous the indoor air quality is by burning fossil fuels in our homes. So my final thing, I just wanna say something about the Marshall Fire. Uh, this is something I've been working particularly hard on. Louisville is, you know, is, is my you know, hometown here. And um, we, you know, I just have to say, this is the third time I've been involved in relief efforts due to a climate change disaster. It was Hurricane Sandy in New York City. It was the floods in, um, in Boulder County and now this. And I'll tell you when I went and, and, and did relief effort for the Marshall Fire, I went, dang, this feels so familiar. So what we've been working on is things to help. Hey, uh, Tracy. Tracy? Yep. I, yeah, I'm sorry. I just want to make sure we have time for five minutes for Karen and myself and also okay. uh, Commissioner right. Lewis. One last thing. I am 
I'm working to get immediate relief for the Marshall Fire victim, um, uh, residents who are affected, as well as how do we, what can we do, what can we learn to help with the future disasters that are going to happen. Thank you. Sorry, 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 I went over. No, no worries, no worries. Do we, so should we, uh, Commissioner Lochiman is here, should we let her go or we finish with questions for Max? I just want to be respectful of people's time. Um, the commissioner is on, not on yet, so um, Senator Hawkins Lewis, you can take it away with your legislative update. Okay, great, excellent. Hi, everybody. Sonia uh, Hawkins Lewis here. I have uh, Longmont and Lafayette and Louisville, and I see so many of you on. I'm going to do a shout out to Mayor Peck from Longmont, as is here tonight, and we have City Councilwoman Deb Fahey. Uh, speaking of the fire, she is one of the most impacted person uh, people in Louisville. Uh, Deb, you know, our hearts are with you, uh, with you losing your home there. Thank you for your service to Louisville. And Jennifer Parenti is on. She is looking to be a, uh, a, a house rep um, in the future. So Jennifer, just want to do a shout out. Uh, I, you see some of my bills here. I've spoken with many of you on the uh, town hall and other uh, town hall settings, but I'll just do a quick update. Uh, we could really use your help on Senate Bill 131. Uh, that is our people and pollinator protection bill. Uh, this Thursday at 1.30, you can testify. It will be before Senate Ag. It will uh, basically stop some of the chemicals, regulate some of the chemicals that kill bees and hurt children too. We have great science uh, indicating that school um, schools are affected. Uh, it will also give local control so that uh, communities, cities that want to regulate pesticides can do that. Um, also, the uh, don't tax dignity. It's also known as the tampon tax uh, over 20 states have passed that across the country. Uh, it will give a, a tax break to many women and working families. Um, it's an unfair tax on medical necessity. So we wanna, we wanna make sure we offer folks that um, the ability to do that. So I think I saw a comment. I know that Carol and Kathy are on the town hall. I know how much you support our Vote Without Fear Act um, we can no longer accept intimidation at the polling centers. We've had uh, instances reported to us that uh, someone with a uh, open uh, weapon is uh, within sight of a drop box. Uh, we can't have that. And I do, a, I thank my uh, uh, co colleagues in the house for passing that and getting that over to us. Thank you so much for that commitment. Uh, the Wage Theft Act, uh, if we had had time, we could have actually had the Attorney General speak on that. He's been helping us. Uh, that's to modify so that folks that are owed monies and wages, we can make that process simpler. And uh, yes, someone asked about fracking, regulating water use in fracking. Well, we, it's not exactly in this legislation, but we are trying to make sure that we can do more regulation around what is happening with documenting uh, uh, what's happening with uh, air quality, as Tracy mentioned, and chemicals so that we can track them more. It's a, it is a mandate for the Oil and Gas Commission. Uh, I won't, you'll, we'll let you know when the bill is launched, but uh, we've been doing a lot of stakeholder. I will stop there, but last uh, comment is, we are still doing everything we can for fire victims uh, from the Marshall Fire, as Tracy mentioned. Uh, we were able to get uh, property taxes uh, stopped for this year. Why should you pay tax on a property you no longer have? And that bill has passed and will be signed tomorrow. I'm so proud to say we are signing that bill tomorrow. So uh, we are going to continue to work on this. It, it is not uh, anything that we are not uh, going to be watching all the time through the session and beyond. So I'll stop there because I want my call. I want to hear what Karen is up to. <laughs> Rep McCormick, you can go ahead with your update. Thank you. I'm setting my timer. Um, 
Thank you all very much. So uh, these are some things that have already gone through committee. So that first bill is a bill that was brought to us by um, people that uh, are in the Medicaid community, particularly with having to access occupational therapists, physical therapists, and speech therapists on the ability to use um, therapy using equine movement, which is using a horse in assisted therapies um, that can prove very beneficial to the um, patient in improving outcomes um, in their uh, treatment regimens. And it was not being reimbursed properly through our, um, our department here at the state level. Um, this has been worked on for many, many years and we finally got it through, I'm very happy to say. And I wanna alert everyone that there is a brand new state-of-the-art facility uh, that CSU is housing down here in Denver um, that is a beautiful, beautiful building. I recommend everybody go see it. They have an entire arena with a glass um, wall where you can watch these therapies um, happening and very happy to get that through. Um, the next one is a bill that will help many of our nonprofit uh agencies and nonprofit organizations are, have really been struggling these last couple of years. They use quite a bit of their fundraising uh, comes through charitable bingo and raffles. And uh, that has really fallen off and hurt them um, tremendously. There's probably over 300 nonprofits that depend on charitable gaming for their um, expenses. And so we did get that one through that will increase their ability to offer a few more games, which is great. The CDPH data bill is one that was brought by um, Out Boulder County, um, specifically addressing the LGBTQ community and seeing um, areas of health inequities and access, especially through COVID. And this bill will direct um, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment to collect data at, on a voluntary level at the patient side on sexual orientation, gender identification, disability, race, and ethnicity so that as we get better data and it'll be disaggregated and not identifiable, uh, we'll be able to drive um, better outcomes on, on the healthcare side. The Veterinary Practice Act is every, every um, profession that is regulated through our Colorado Occupational Regulatory Authority um, comes up for kind of review every 10 or 11 years. This year, the Veterinary Practice Act is up. Um, and what's, what's kind of exciting about it, not because I'm a veterinarian, that's exciting, but that we also are folding into the Practice Act uh, a new profession, which is the regulation of the veterinary technicians. And this has been in discussion with both professions over the last two years. Um, very collaborative effort um, that came together very nicely. That will be heard in committee next week. I'm still working on a diaper changing station bill that was brought by a constituent of ours um, and hoping to get late bill status on that to make sure that uh, diaper changing stations are available to um, all genders in any bathroom in publicly owned buildings. Um, this was brought by um, a young father with his baby that was frustrated trying to find a place to change uh, his baby's diaper. Um, I'm also working, um, there's a bill coming from the Senate side uh, that Senator Hansen is working on that is a big environmental bill. And there's a part of that bill um, that has to do with agricultural resilience, um, as well as ways that the agricultural community can be um, a real partner in addressing climate change. Um, and I'm waiting to see if I can get on any of the five buckets that were discussed by Max Nardo in the housing task force. I'm very interested in moving forward and on um, some of those issues that we can bring um, Bring home to Longmont. And with that, I have 20 seconds left. I'm going to stop. Well, thank you all for your updates. Um, I think we we don't have Commissioner um, Lochamin on yet. Um, so we can see if she'll get on in the next few minutes, um, but we can move into a Q&A right now. Um, we do have- uh, Hey guys, she's here. I see her. Oh, oh, perfect. 
Hi, County Commissioner. Um, go ahead, if you wanted to go ahead with your presentation, we have plenty of time for it. Sure, buenas tardes, good afternoon. My name is Marta Luch, I'm Boulder County Commissioner, District 2. And I just got the link, so I apologize. I was hoping to hear the rest of the presentation and be able to build off what you all were talking about. But um, I was asked to join you all, and thank you for the invitation to talk a little bit about, um, in less than five minutes, two really big topics. One, ARPA and Boulder County, and then two, Marshall Fire. So really briefly, just to give folks an update, I was leading the community engagement for phase one of the ARPA state and local funding uh, for Boulder County, which is $63.3 million allocation just for the county. Everybody um, I'm sure has talked about the different um, buckets that are going around in, in, in other areas and for other particular focuses. And so we just started today, actually had a significant uh, working group with uh, about 60 members of our community, community partners, Boulder County staff, department heads, and each one of the commissioners will be taking on what the community has told us through that phase one community engagement process of the, the areas that we need to focus on for Boulder County, which is housing, no surprise, economic challenges, probably not a, a surprise there either, and then mental health and, and social social isolation as the third topic. So very excited about that work. Just kick that off for phase two today. The other piece uh, is around Marshall Fire and it, clearly we all have a lot of work to do. Um, the initial response was significant. We, there's, there's not time to give gratitude to all the folks and all the players, all the partnerships, the collaboration that we're able to do evacuations, et cetera, et cetera, uh, starting on December 30th, Boulder County staff in every department all over has been on the ground since the incident command center, since the disaster assistance center that was set up by that Monday after, which really is one of the quickest um, responses from state and federal supports as well. We had 27 agencies in that center. Um, that DAC has since closed and huge shout out to Community Foundation Boulder County who has been a significant partner for all of us um, with uh, 30 million plus uh, of, of raised funds that the community, that the first $5 million was given to Boulder County to address our residents in, in some of those initial pieces. The donation center is open. The long-term recovery group has been forming over the last three weeks. So there, that is a different opportunity for folks who are still asking, how can I help? How can I be involved? We have different subcommittees that are working on their the other piece that I'm sure people are asking about is the debris removal. Those are significant conversations that we are having right now, not just the town, not just the city, but also Boulder County as, as far as the unincorporated Boulder County residents who lost their homes. And so those different light item, line items are uh, pieces that we are working through together. And as you all know, the good news last week was that all three of those um, jurisdictions made the commitment to use FEMA funding, state funding and county funding to create that solution, um, including foundations for, um, for residents who were directly impacted and, and lost their homes. And so that's kind of one of the pieces. The other one, just from an update standpoint, the commissioners have uh, are taking leads on that those pieces now from the Marshall Fire, the, I'll be working with the long-term recovery group. As I said, we're still looking for volunteers. There's folks addressing everything from un, unmet needs, uh, rebuilding to the uh, mental and spiritual needs um, and, 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 and a, a few other groups that are working there. Um, Commissioner Claire Levy has taken on a significant role for unincorporated Boulder County residents, meeting with them weekly to hear those specific needs and, and guiding us in that response. And Commissioner Matt Jones is working with the rebuilding team. And the other piece that there's a lot of conversation about is the, the green building. And Oscar, our Office of Sustainability, Sustainability, Climate Action and Resiliency is doing a lot of work with a lot of the partners I'm sure that are participating this evening and a lot of our state legislators to uh, give residents an opportunity to also not just rebuild, but rebuild back in a, an efficient and sustainable way. Um, and the, the code, I'm sure somebody's already spoke about it. So that is, is the quick, quick um, summary and some of the particular updates that folks are asking about. Um, the long-term recovery group meets every Tuesday from 10 to noon 
the uh, unincorporated residents are meeting on Friday um, afternoon at noon, um, and the rebuilding work continues with partners like SWEEP with our Department of Oscar and some of those proposals are coming through so that we can use sustainability tax to fund those very important issues that will create long-term opportunities and open some doors, including potentially um, some text amendments of opportunities of using ADUs for residents right now who are asking for, a, who need a place to live in the interim. So a lot of work happening. Thank you for the invitation. I don't know if there's gonna be time for questions um, and or in the chat. Perfect. Thank you so much for that presentation, Commissioner. Um, we do have a little bit of time for a Q&A. Like I said, if your question isn't answered, I'm sure there are a lot of questions that won't be, but we'll get to a, a couple of them. Um, we'll be reaching out directly. Uh, all the questions will go to all these panelists. Um, we do have... A could, we, uh, could we, before you uh, do that one, I would love to see uh commissioner lochum and what else do you need from us i know money 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 is always good and we we did the tax deferment we're putting the money back in to help keep counties whole help keep boulder county whole um what what else do you need from us is there anything else specific because you've got us here we are <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the question. I mean, yes, you're right. And I think that the conversation about funding and resources go, is, is going to be a long one. Um, as I mentioned before, a community foundation has stepped up to really be a, an anchor of philanthropy and the need is, is, is much greater. We're talking about uh, an uninsured uh, amount of over a hundred million dollars in a need. There's also, I mean, FEMA has been on the ground, SBA has been on the ground. And I think so part of the communication that could be very helpful is really looking at how much money has been brought in and reminding folks that we are supporting and what other creative ways that can we come together and utilize and leverage and make sure that we're communicating what really is um, so that's going to be important. And then looking at some of these other opportunities that might create solutions at the same time, because we've got issues that were already existed. We already had obviously a lack of housing and we had um, other pressures in our communities. And so how do we um, bring in some other opportunities? I know folks on this call have also been really helpful in regards to some of the conversations with Excel, with the rebates that really are going to be supporting folks to be able to eliminate something off of the, the long uh, Excel spreadsheets of costs that are going to be incurred. So I appreciate that that question. Great. I think we had a question from Elizabeth about, is that the one you were gonna do? Oh, go uh, ahead, Senator Hawkins Lewis. Yeah, I think we had a question from Elizabeth. Actually, now I'm trying to find it. So I think it was about water, but does anybody see it, Karen Tracy? Um, I, answer, oh, I answered. I answered. I answered one. Yeah. Um, okay. We do have Wait. another one on funding um, from the response template. Um, it, it can go to anyone who wants to answer. I know you all are interested in this. Um, but is there money being spent on mitigating the effects of climate change? Um, I don't know if this is more general or having to do with ARPA, but feel free to answer how you wish. Okay, I'll take a I'll take a crack at that. Um, I'd have to say that um, first of all, last year it was really transformational in terms of the number of things that we did from a climate standpoint, and uh, that money. Uh, and what I'm seeing right now is I'm getting calls from Canada, from other places around the world about some of the bills, uh, my Buy Clean Colorado bill that is uh, uh, focusing on uh, using clean, uh, greener construction materials. So a lot of the things we did last year are really um, uh, percolating, let me say, across the, across the country and across the world. Um, I look at the, the, you know, the things that we still need to tackle, um, the air quality, you know, that bill, ozone is a greenhouse gas. By attacking the uh, addressing the things that are uh, impacting ozone, that is addressing climate change. The building codes bill. This is getting us to off of the hardest thing it is to get off of, and that is the fossil fuels that we use in our buildings. So this is uh, money is being spent. You know, on I've got um, you know money will be spent on that. Uh, and like I said, the air quality. Uh, we're putting money toward uh, a lot of the monitoring equipment. 
Um, and uh, Rep McCormick did talk about agriculture. I think that's another area to, uh, to address, as well as there's another thing I've been working on. It won't come out this year, but this is the next thing. You know, everybody talks about net zero. That we have to go, we have to do better than that. We have to pull the carbon that's already in the atmosphere out. Con carbon, re uh, carbon dioxide removal, CDR. This is something I've been studying up on. Uh, I know the city of Boulder is actually doing some work in this area. So how do we foster pulling the carbon that's already in our air out and sequestering it? Yeah, that's great, Tracy. Thank you. I mean, we there's so many things contributing to climate change. We have a bit, very big commitment to have more uh, EVs and more EV infrastructure. Um, that's in the uh, infrastructure bill that was passed by by federal by Congress. Uh, my oil and gas bill that I'm working with some other folks that's going to hold the oil and gas uh, companies accountable uh, for uh, PFAS and uh, benzene in the water. Um, you know, we we have. I think the Boulder County delegation is leading on uh, green energy and climate change issues. Um, so a lot of our folks at the Capitol look to us, and we are so lucky to have President Fenberg now, Steve Fenberg, who's part of our uh, Boulder County delegation now, the president of the Senate. So um, yeah, any anything else, Karen? You want to get in there on climate change or? Yeah, I was just going to um, expand on what we're what is being worked on with um, Senator Hansen's bill and um, a initiative out of CSU and those working in um, the Colorado Collaborative for Healthy Soils and the Ag Next program and many many others on a portion of that bill that will really direct the participation of the ag sector in this whole issue and how best to um, encourage and uh, participation in that, um, in that piece uh, with ag producers, farmers and ranchers across our state. Um, so I'm pretty excited uh, to see how that particular piece of that bill moves forward um, because it, it really could play a big role. And so, Lewis, I, oh, so sorry, go ahead, Commissioner. Go Thank ahead. You. Yeah, no, excuse me. I just want to jump in really quick on the, the question around ARPA funds and climate change. Climate change, we, we know we have a climate crisis, and we also need to recognize and remember that ARPA funds truly is for those most affected by COVID 19. And so, and what makes that really challenging for us right now is we also have folks who are very, um, affected and in need because of the Marshall Fire, but we have to be really careful about federal guidelines and ensure that we are using those funds, each bucket of funds for, for the correct pieces. So I just want to make sure that we message that out as well. And I also wanted to respond to the question about y'all, I've got y'all's attention right now, disaster case management will be a need in Boulder County. We still haven't finished an unmet needs survey. There's still assessments out there. So we don't know what the, typically 10% of those affected um, who have registered for aid will need help. So just a just a last ask in there since it was put on the table. Thank you. I'd also like to say that there's a lot of wildfire mitigation bills that are going through right now. So uh, yeah, it, it is, people are, are really waking up, I think. Yeah. Well, we want to be respectful of folks' times. Um, Max, thank you so much. Uh, really, Max is an expert at the Capitol. He's amazing. His knowledge, we're so lucky to have him. And uh, Commissioner Lochman, really, thank you so much. We're so lucky to have you in Boulder County. Um, any last words of wisdom? I'm just pleased as punch that we have so many people interested in what we're doing uh, during session. I'm glad we could get away. I had fellow colleagues in the Senate saying, we can't believe you're having a town hall during session. Well, you know what? We are all, if I can speak for Tracy and Karen, we're committed to being available to you. And this is one way to do it. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I'm also very proud, even though it seems very far away, that the Senate and the House both passed a resolution in support of a Ukraine and um, how how deeply we are our hearts hurt 
for this, um, but we are all part of a very important democracy and it's important that we do use our voices to stand up um, for those that are fighting for the same uh, across, across the world. So I just wanted to recognize that um, we will be watching that closely and um, knowing that we, we deeply care about what's going on there. Then I just want to say thank you, everybody, for coming. I certainly echo. Uh, Rep, I say Rep McCormick had some really heartfelt words this morning on the on the floor about Ukraine. So, um, uh, you know, thank you for coming. Keep the emails coming, and I'm looking forward to the next town hall. Yes. Good night, everyone.